first one comes from studio8.ca. How long does it take the microbiome to recover after taking medication? Well, I assume you mean antibiotic medications, but what's becoming more and more important to realize is way back when, when prescription medications first came out, we had no idea that the microbiome even existed, number one. We had no idea that the microbiome might actually eat these medications. And number three, we had no idea that the microbiome might actually change these medications, might make them less active, more active. And finally, we had no idea that the microbiome would actually change in response to prescription medications. In fact, all of this is true. In my upcoming book, The Gut-Brain Paradox, you'll be startled to see what effect the microbiome has on prescription medications and what effect prescription medications have on the microbiome. And it's shocking. In fact, at least 40% of prescription medications we now know have a dramatic effect on the microbiome. And the microbiome and its biodiversity has a dramatic effect on that prescription medication's effect on you. But having said all that, antibiotics are what most people are worried about. And here's the bad news. Studies that I've cited in the books have shown that one course of antibiotics can pretty much deplete your entire microbiome down to just a few species for as much as two years following taking those antibiotics. However, there is evidence that the more we get probiotics and prebiotics into us during the course of antibiotic therapy, after the course of antibiotic therapy, it is possible to start repopulating the gut within two to three months. So I think the key is here, yes, antibiotics can be life-saving, but they threaten the life of that other organism that lives within you, the microbiome. And you gotta do your best to repopulate that. That's why the more different strains that I can get into you following a course of antibiotics, I think you're well served. We also know that there are keystone species that I talk about in Gut Check that will foster the growth of other antibiotics. So hope that is a long-winded answer to your question. Live Natural, a dash Lee, the best food to benefit the thyroid. Well, I'll tell you, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. First of all, one of the things that I harp on a lot to my patients is you've got to get iodized sea salt into your diet. In the early 1900s, over 10 million Americans died from hypothyroidism. Uh, and I won't go into why that was, but it was because of this that the federal government mandated iodine in salt because everybody used salt. And that's where the little girl with the umbrella, Morton Salt, came about. Up until a few years ago, really the only salt that was available was iodized by law. With the advent of sea salt and pink salt, Himalayan salt, there was a trend that these were better, they had more minerals, and the whole iodine part was forgotten. Early on in my current career, I noticed a large number of people with hypothyroidism who did not have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And I started supplementing them with either iodine uh, supplements or I just asked them to return to using iodized salt, iodized sea salt. Now there's 10 different iodized sea salts available. Even Morton makes one. So one of the best foods to support thyroid function is iodized salt. And you wouldn't believe how many times that little addition to people's diet makes all the world in their thyroid health. Now, having said that, 
the foods that hurt the thyroid, and I've talked about this before, I do have some very well-meaning patients who love cruciferous vegetables, and they are fanatics for cruciferous vegetables. They use cauliflower rice, they use broccoli slaw, they use cabbage, they eat arugula, they eat bok choy, all of which are part of the cruciferous vegetable family. And they eat so much of it that they actually do suppress their thyroid function. That's an easy fix. I see it on their blood work and I go, hey, you eat a lot of cruciferous vegetables. They say, yeah, I do, they're so good for me. And I said, well, you know, watch this trend. And I just ask them to back off on their cruciferous vegetables, not eliminate them. And lo and behold, their thyroid function returns. Now, we could do a whole lecture on Hashimoto's thyroiditis and the foods that affect that. The important part is that Hashimoto's is caused by gut dysbiosis and leaky gut, the one-two punch. And I'm pleased to say that following the recommendations in the plant paradox, eliminating lectins, feeding good bacteria with prebiotic fiber, with polyphenols, in my practice, over 90% of Hashimoto's patients go into remission. They no longer have antithyroid antibodies. So the foods that hurt the thyroid are far more important to focus on than foods that benefit the thyroid. Next question, restoring you. If I had only one to take, which one of your supplements should I take and why? Uh, well, if you only had one of them, quite frankly, I would take BioComplete 3. It's actually my number one seller. It's been my number one seller since it was introduced, and there's a very good reason. First of all, it has both probiotics, friendly bacteria. It has prebiotics that feed friendly bacteria. But most importantly, it has available postbiotics, which are the beneficial, in this case, short-chain fatty acids like butyrate that probiotics make. And one of the holy grails of colon health, of gut health, of brain health is these short-chain fatty acids like butyrate. And interestingly enough, time after time when patients come in, with their gut microbiome um, panel that they have had done or that I do on them, almost universally, these patients lack butyrate-producing bacteria. And delivering butyrate to where it needs to be, which is in the colon, is one of the things that really sets BioComplete 3 apart. And there's a really good reason why it's my best seller. And if you're going to take one, that's the one I'd take. Lana Lagata. I think I got that right. Would you please address the root cause of acne? Is it candida or is it possible that the MTHFR gene and my ability to detoxify cause my acne? Thank you for everything you do, Dr. Gundry. You have saved so many people's lives. Well, thank you, Ms. Lagata. No, acne is not caused by candida overgrowth. Um, it's not the MTHFR gene. Acne has a very specific gut microbiome dysbiosis and leaky gut that we can measure. Uh, and correcting that acne is really possible by changing the gut microbiome and eliminating leaky gut. And I see this all the time. I've had multiple patients with even severe cystic acne who completely cleared on my program. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, years ago, we had a beautiful young lady who had horrible cystic acne, cleared in about six months, uh, cleared her leaky gut, cleared her gut dysbiosis, was delighted. She went with her husband and her parents on a vacation to Paris, France for two weeks. And since she was cured, she, of course, ate all the fabulous bread and croissants. And uh, you guessed it, 
Uh, her cystic acne flared with a vengeance uh, while she was at the end of the trip. And final part of the story, when she came back, she went right back on the program and her acne cleared within six weeks. It's not caused by a candida overgrowth. It's not by your MTHFR gene. If it was your MTHFR gene, 50% of people carry at least one mutation and 50% of people should have acne and they don't. So uh, it's gut dysbiosis and leaky gut, and it can be fixed. That's the good news. Lisa Bosa, top three natural alternatives to Ozempic. So one of the things that we have to realize is that we do have bacteria in our gut that make GLP-1 agonists. And we should be well aware that if we have the right bacteria and we give them what they want to eat, then they will make GLP-1 that will curb your appetite. In fact, there was a recent study that uh, I wrote about actually in my upcoming book, The Gut Brain Paradox, that there are bacteria in your small intestine that uh, will make these compounds, but these bacteria need, you need to ba basically feed about a million of them so that they reach what's called a quorum and then they'll start making these compounds. Now, how long does this take after you eat to grow a million bacteria? Well, this one paper shows it takes about 20 minutes after you eat to grow a million of these bacteria to produce the compound that you're looking for. 20 minutes. Now, there are many societies that practice uh, waiting until you feel full to decide on whether to have dessert. And it just so happens that the recommended time period is give it about 20 minutes before you really decide whether you want to have dessert. So now we have an underlying reason where that societal recommendation came from. And it actually comes from the fact that you actually have to have about 20 minutes to build up enough bacteria to produce the compounds you're looking for. Now, there are other ways. I happen to be a big fan of berberine. And I have a video on the health benefits of berberine. And check it out on this channel. So the main thing is we have bacteria that'll make ozempic but you got to wait for them to kick in. So that's my advice. Good question. Many Timmons, what are your recommendations for a diet for endurance athlete? What adjustments would you make to your eating protocol? Well, that's a great question. Uh, this has been studied extensively uh, at Stanford, and there have been trials with uh, athletes, both performance athletes and endurance athletes looking at a animal-based diet and a plant-based diet. And surprisingly, uh, this was done by uh, the head of nutrition, Christopher Gardner, professor there. And surprisingly, there was absolutely no difference in performance between plant-based athletes and meat-based athletes. I think that surprises a lot of people. It certainly didn't surprise, I think, the researchers. Just remember that we, there are plenty of available amino acids in both plants and animal sources. And even though plants may be deficient, in other words, less amino acids than certain animal proteins, Christopher Gardner makes the point, there's still plenty to do what you need to do. If plants were deficient in these, then I guess then a wildebeest couldn't outrun a lion uh, on a plant-based diet. Just remember, the largest creatures on land are actually plant eaters, not animal eaters. So uh, I think this whole idea that we have to have a special diet for performance 
Uh, luckily, in human trials has been put to rest uh, primarily at Stanford. But that's a great question. Hattie Mans, my triglyceride levels skyrocketed after turning to lectin-free, low-carb, high-fat diet. Any idea why? That's very unusual. First of all, most triglycerides do not come from fats. They are fats made from carbohydrates. The only time that I have seen this, and it sounds like you are actually on a ketogenic diet, particularly if you say it's a high-fat diet, the only time I have actually seen this is that when people are mobilizing fat from their fat stores, they are carried in triglycerides. And so I would bet that that's what was going on with you. And if you modify your ketogenic diet to my modified ketogenic diet, you won't see this happen. How do I know this? Because I've never seen this happen in my patients on my modified ketogenic diet, but I have seen it in a couple of patients who have eaten a traditional ketogenic diet of 80% fat and low protein and low carbohydrates. Great question. Common jingle. I was recently diagnosed with fibromuscular dysplasia in both carotid arteries. As you well know, there is no known cause or cure for FMD. Do you believe the plant paradox diet could be beneficial for FMD patients? Yes, I do. I treat uh, a number of patients with FMD successfully. Uh, I personally think it is an autoimmune condition. And so I hope that answers your question. If so, can the serving sizes be increased? For me personally, I can't afford to lose any weight. Well, absolutely. If weight loss is not your issue, and certainly a number of patients that I see do not need to lose weight, but they have an autoimmune disease, then portion size uh, goes out the window. And again, most of my patients who I want to gain weight I increase their nut consumption primarily in macadamia nuts, but whatever nut you want to use, please, no peanuts and cashews, they're not nuts at all. But you should be tested for leaky gut. All of my patients with fibromuscular dysplasia, uh, even in their renal arteries, their kidney arteries, uh, test positive for leaky gut. Many of them test positive for other autoimmune markers like anti-nuclear antibody, just to use one, and double-stranded DNA to use two. Okay, Intuitive Healing and Wellness and Doce Heart both ask about natural flavoring in products. Well, an intuitive asks about the natural flavoring in my Gundry MD protein. I'm really surprised to see natural flavoring in your ProPlant product because you're a purist. Are you aware of this? Uh, yes, I am, absolutely. Natural flavoring means exactly that, that it's not artificial. It's not derived from chemicals. It's derived from plants. And that's what that means. Alina Step. How does MCT oil impact high cortisol levels, if at all? Cortisol, now I've written chapters about this. Cortisol is not, quote, a stress hormone. During COVID, which was a rather stressful time for most all of us, I rarely saw elevated cortisol levels in my patients. Most of my patients with elevated cortisol levels uh, have sleep issues, sleep apnea, poor quality sleep. They're not stressed out. Most of my high power stressed out executives don't have high cortisol levels. MCT oil does not affect cortisol levels one way or another. The beauty of MCT oil, medium chain triglycerides, is that it is absorbed completely different than any other fat. Fats normally have to be carried across the wall of our gut in moving vans called chylomicrons. MCT oil is directly absorbed through the wall of the gut without moving bands, and it's carried directly into the liver, unlike any other fat that enters the lymphatic system. In the liver, MCT is processed into ketone bodies, ketones, 
which can then be used as a fuel, but more importantly, they are a signaling compound that uncouples mitochondria. Now, if your mitochondria are more improved and protected, you could lower your cortisol level. But quite frankly, elevated cortisol levels are not a big deal. It's actually cortisol resistance that's a big deal, as I talk about in, in my books. Carl Stout, 35. Is rabbit okay to eat? What kind of sugar molecule does it have? Hey, that's a great question. Rabbit actually has new 5 ac And uh, as long as the rabbit is out eating grass, which is what it's supposed to do, a rabbit is a good part of, uh, of a good diet. More amazing episodes just like this one. Watch now. What most people unfortunately don't know is that vitamin C is critical for knitting collagen together. And vitamin C, we don't manufacture. So you have to swallow it. 